and we have to really escalate the noise we make so that we'll be heard. Welcome to Gay USA. I'm Andy Hum. I'm Ann Northrup, and rubbing an itch on her eye. Lots of big news this week. A federal appeals court has made a momentous ruling saying that a potential juror may not be excluded on the basis of sexual orientation, but more importantly, extending a high level of judicial review, heightened scrutiny to cases of discrimination against gays and lesbians. We'll try not to get too complicated about that, but, but it's we big, are. Big. <laughs> It is. That's all you need to know. It's big. Uh, meanwhile, in a smaller venue, but also uh, somewhat big, the Oregon Labor Board has ruled that a baker, a bakery, illegally discriminated against a lesbian couple who asked for a wedding cake that he didn't want to make uh, because of his religious reasons. But uh, we have a list of some of the orders he did fill that's a little astonishing. The out lesbian mayor of Houston marries her longtime partner in Palm Springs. The right wing lawyers in representing Utah have succeeded in getting a seven day extension from the Tenth Circuit in their attempt to file an appeal of the order that uh, allows same sex marriage in Utah. Uh, and on our side, the ACLU is has found couples and is suing Utah to make them recognize those couples as legally married, although the governor is trying not to do that. The Methodist Church is now lining up more pastors to defrock for their affirmation of same-sex marriage. An 18-year-old uh, young gay male porn star was suspended from his high school in Florida but reinstated after uh, his classmates and their parents complained. The uh, persecution of gay people in Nigeria has intensified mm. since we last spoke. Uh, while the president of Uganda has balked at the signing this anti-gay bill, but he's seeking a compromise, which would be pretty bad. It's an interesting story. Uh, Vladimir Putin uh, showed up to talk to the international press over the weekend and uh, about every other question was about gay issues. We're going to review the Carol King musical on Broadway and a revival of Machinal. But we're starting with a very old and dear friend, Sean Strube, uh, a longtime activist, uh, founder of Paws Magazine, uh, producer of the play The Night Larry Kramer Kissed Me, uh, founder of the Ciro Project, and now its executive director and author of the really fascinating new book, Body Counts, a memoir of politics, sex, AIDS, and survival. Welcome, Sean. Thanks. Nice to be here again. <laughs> Well, we're very happy to have you here, and this really is a great book, and it's an interesting combination of your life story, your uh, memoir from your uh, days in Iowa all the way through, <laughs> and the uh, HIV-AIDS movement. Uh, so what, at this point, made you think about writing this in the first place? Uh, I had resisted writing about it. I think that a lot of us, you know, during the worst years of the epidemic, we didn't look to the past. You know, we were we were very sort of focused on survival and on the future. We didn't even have time to grieve for people who were who we were losing. And then when my health came back, I kind of retreated and uh, I was very consciously I didn't want to write about the epidemic and I started thinking about about writing a book and I looked at some other topics. Uh, and then I don't know, something seemed to click and we, we entered a kind of look back moment where there suddenly was starting to be cultural production around the early years of the epidemic, exhibits and films and uh, books and more writing. And in an interview uh, for the New York Times with Michael Weinrip, we got into a really kind of intense conversation about it and, uh, and I was sort of making some sort of point and I was saying, well, somebody has to be the memory. And it was literally like a light bulb went off. I thought, my God, you know, I been there and involved so much that I, I started to feel an obligation to uh, to share what I saw, what I witnessed, uh, and I think that there's something, I think it's interesting, and I think there's something to be learned from it. 
Well, uh, bef and before we get into all that, I do just want to ask about your health because mm -hmm. we've certainly seen the, the entire <laughs> arc of experience with you and moments when we thought uh, this is it, and you certainly thought that was it too. So how are you doing? And uh, my, This is a great time in my life. I mean, my health is great. Uh, I've never weighed as much as I weigh now. You know, you remember when I, when I was really sick. I think we I, all I, feel that way. way. <laughs> <laughs> but when, you know, I weigh 42 pounds more than I weighed when I was really sick. Wow. Uh, and there's a picture of me in the book with, you know, chaos lesions all over. And, um, well, yeah. how does that feel to go through that, uh, that whole length of experience? Uh, you know, we don't often get the chance to yeah. sit down because uh, mostly it feels too personal. But now that we've got you in front of TV cameras <laughs> and a worldwide audience, uh, uh, what, what was that like? Uh, I mean, I don't know any different. You know, that was my life. It was the life of, you know, for, for a lot of us. Um, you know, the privacy stuff with, with the magazine, when I started putting in my, you know, lab reports and doctors analyzing everything from my mental health to whatever, I kind of got past the, you know, concern about what, <laughs> what people learned about me, although this is a whole new level of intimacy in here. Mm -hmm. uh, my life changed. Uh, it really did change. You know, there's an interview with Armistead Mopin on BuzzFeed right now, and he uh, talks about this time in his life and how much he appreciates you know the moment and the joy he finds every day and um, and I think that happened to me uh, when my health came back and I realized there was something a new preciousness with my life. Now when did you find out that you had HIV? Uh, well officially not until the test came out in 85 um, but the very first time in July of 1981 when that first New York Times story reported um, three symptoms that people who were dying shared, uh, I got this feeling in the pit of my stomach because I'd experienced all three. Uh, weight loss, which I had attributed to moving to New York and a you know, faster paced lifestyle. You know, uh, uh, night sweats, I didn't know they had a name, I just thought I sweat a lot. Uh, and um, persistently swollen lymph glands. And the year before, while I was at Columbia, I had ended up at Sloan Kettering uh, with the concern I had a lymphoma, which now we think was probably my serial conversion sickness. Right, so in those days, we knew people who died within a week. Right. Uh, most people didn't last more than two years. To what do you attribute your survival? And I, and I remember you know, seeing you through a lot of these periods. You, know, you, you had a unique approach to this. Yeah. Um, you know, I think part of it was my skepticism. You know, I, I was very consciously skeptical of everything I was told about the epidemic from the media, from the government, from drug companies. The only people I believed were, were people with AIDS, honestly. And that became my you know, go-to experts. And I think a lot of people you know, maybe had a, a fear or a resistance. You know, they, they isolated themselves from that. And, uh, but I found it, it, it to enrich my life and to give me the information that I needed. I also, uh, around the time I was diagnosed, I read an article about different forms of cancer, and it said that the, re the, the most uh, lethal form of cancer was 96% fatal. Now, you know, not great odds, but that's one out of 25 survive. And I hadn't heard anybody say that AIDS was, was more deadly than the worst form of cancer. Uh -huh. I mean, this may sound like tortured logic, but this is what was going through my head. And uh, in Michael Callan's book, Surviving AIDS, had a big influence on me as well because he identified three characteristics amongst people he knew who were, who were then living with AIDS. The first was they believed survival was possible. Somebody was going to survive. May or may not be me, but someone would survive. Uh, and the second was that they could identify some reason for their survival, some reason to get up in the morning, whether it's you know taking care of their kids or their career, or you know wanting to be around to see you know somebody graduate from school, or their activism or their religious faith. Um, they they had some purpose, uh, and I never lacked purpose. Uh, and uh, and the third was that when asked what they did to treat their illness, it wasn't what they said; it was the length of the list because those were the people who were seeking survival. And I tried everything, and, and you know, macrobiotics and acupuncture and visualization and you, know, you name it, you can go right through it. And people say, oh, that didn't work or that didn't work. They all worked. You know, I learned something from every single strategy that I uh, employed in treating the, the virus. And, and collectively, it gave me um, 
um, sort of the confidence to make my own treatment decisions going forward. And in the midst of this, in 1994, before we have protease inhibitors, which right. turned the epidemic around, you found <laughs> uh, Paz Magazine. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, a slick uh, uh, magazine of information, lifestyle, everything in, in it. And what were you thinking? Uh, I at was thinking time. at the time that that I lived, you know, knowing all these people with AIDS who were leading vibrant lives, right? They're involved in their activism and their businesses and their careers. That that was a bubble that was so different from what was in the mainstream media. You know, in everywhere, anytime AIDS was referenced, it was uh, inevitably fatal, dread disease, 100% fatal, no survivors, terminal illness, no cure. There was never anything that even allowed for the possibility of survival. It, the possibility of survival in terms of the mainstream you know, uh, public discourse had been taken away from people who, um, who had the disease. And yet I saw this in my own life, something very different. And so uh, I started thinking we needed to share these stories and to show these examples. You know, I was benefiting from knowing and talking to so many people, other people who had, uh, who had HIV. There are lots of people around the country who don't have that luxury. They didn't live in the village. They couldn't go to you know, meetings you know, every night or whatever. Right. And so the magazine kind of became that connection. And, and people developed intensely personal relationships with our columnists, with the people who wrote in the magazine, because they got to know them. So well, those were their friends, and those are the people they trusted uh, to learn about how to cope with the illness. I want to backtrack a little because the first section of this book is about your youth and growing up in Iowa and then coming to Washington uh, first and then New York. And you were an ambitious kid. You wanted to be in politics. You were entrepreneurial at an early age. Uh, but coming out was not easy for you at that early age. And you, I was struck by the amount you talk in the book about fear and guilt. And uh, I'd like to because we see you and have known you for 25 years and have seen you as a self-confident, successful guy, <laughs> sick or well, you've always had that uh, list of ambitions. But So I, I saw a different side of you in this book uh, when I read about those earlier years. Uh, well, I mean, you know, I think the closet remains terrifying for people today. Even though the society has changed in so many ways, that doesn't mean an individual closet is really that much different uh, in terms of how it was experienced by that person than it was years ago. You know, I grew up in a very Catholic family. You know, my three sisters' first names were all Mary because of my father's devotion to the Virgin. I went to a Jesuit boarding school when I was 13. You know, I briefly thought I'd be a priest and so on. So I, you know, and I really absorbed that Catholicism in a way that translated into a hatred of who I was and my body. And it took a long time to overcome those things. And then you combine that with political ambition, right? I was so obsessed with politics mm -hmm. where... Elevator operator in the U.S. Senate <laughs> when you were, what, 17, right, 18? Right. And a page in the Iowa State Senate yeah. before that. Um, and of all careers, that's really an especially lousy one back then to be gay in, right? mm -hmm. you know, because it was just seen as such a, a, a you know a, a career killer. So you combine those two things with an utter ignorance about my body and about sexuality. Even though I was precocious in other ways, I knew nothing about my body or sexuality. I, mean, I talk in the book about you know going into a dirty bookstore to, to uh, look at a, at a porno film. Uh, to see if men actually had intercourse, because right. I had heard people talking about, you know, uh, having sex that way, but I, I thought it was just sort of like, you know, it was just to, to mimic what heterosexuals did. That they didn't really do that; they just pretended to do that. That was, in, and I was 18 years old at that time, you know, living in Washington, been out of a home, and I went into. I remember peering at the, you know, the little flickering screen and figuring out this wasn't trick photography, and uh, and the. the the guys were enjoying it, you know, yeah. and so was that. that was a revelation. Some of these things, you know, the um, Michael Bronsky in the review in the San Francisco Chronicle, one of the points he focused on in the book was in 1980, and you'll both remember this, when the New York Times reviewed John Boswell's book, uh, mm -hmm. Christianity, Social Tolerance, uh, Homosexuality, Christianity, and Social Tolerance. And not only was, you know, the book amazing and the, the review was fantastic, but just the very fact that the New York Times reviewed the book. 
Well, we were lucky if we got one story a year out of the time. Exactly. And it, it turned out to be the same way with AIDS for a while. Exactly. Uh, which uh, was terrible. And that morning, that Sunday, when that was in there, uh, Tom Stoddard and I were hanging out. Tom uh, Stoddard, who was head of the Lambda Legal Defense. Right. Not then, but, but, but later. Yes. And we're at his apartment Sunday morning reading the, the, the Times. And he gets to that, and he let out this whoop, this holler. I thought, like, what happened? He started reading it to me, and then he got on the phone to, I think, Rich Meislin and, and some other friends of his, and he was reading it in this, like, stentorian voice, like he was reading the Declaration of Independence <laughs> or something, you know. And it was just so amazing that the New York Times was, in a very matter-of-fact way, acknowledging this brilliant piece of scholarship People have no idea us. unless they live in Nigeria. Uh, now, you describe yourself you say campaigning uh, is your natural mode of being. <laughs> well, and, and both political and, and causes. So, what, and you did run for office for right, U.S. Congress as the first openly HIV positive person I did. to do that. So, what are the what are the? If you're still involved in campaigning, but what are the campaigns you're proudest of? Um, oh, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, I think that that I've really tried to sort of. You know, carry the flame of the empowerment movement and the Denver principles and the the concept of self empowerment for people with HIV. Which Maybe is, explain them what that is. Denver principles. Well, in in 1983, it was the first time a group of people with AIDS ever gathered uh, from around the country to strategize politically, and that's when they rejected the word victim and wanted to be identified as people with AIDS and so on. And that was the first time in the history of humanity where people who shared a disease organized to assert a collective voice politically. They say, we have a right to participate in these things. And in that sense, that document is like the, you know, the Magna Carta or Constitution or whatever for, for people who, uh, who have some sort of health condition. It was largely based on uh, the women's health movement in the 60s and 70s. It was basically feminist health principles, you know, codified in this document around this uh, uh, disease that in many ways was the most radical AIDS activism to date, you know, much more so than ACT UP. You know, right. uh, ACT UP, you know, which was very important to me, and we did a lot of kind of like outrageous things, but in terms of the basic concept of what we were doing, we were basically trying to uh, manipulate the levers of power as they existed, not create a different system. Inclu and, including in the medical establishment, you change medicine for everybody, not just for people with AIDS. For good or evil. For good or evil, <laughs> exactly. Well, that's one of the points I talk yeah. about in here. You know that that I don't think at the time when you know we were demonstrating and getting arrested and and pushing for regulatory reform at the FDA, that we realized the extent to which we were carrying heavy water for the pharmaceutical industry. This was in the Reagan era yeah. when everything was being deregulated. We never did anything that bothered a pharmaceutical company <laughs> one twitch compared to the incredible benefit we did for them that made them billions and billions, hundreds of billions of dollars by stripping away these regulatory processes and making it far less costly for them to bring d drugs to market. Uh, and you know, that's a very complicated issue, but only in, I think, the perspective of time can we kind of like see some of these things. There's a lot in this book that uh, sort of looks at those situations mm -hmm. and, and reconsiders them with the benefit of hindsight and that's one of the things that makes this fascinating. Mm -hmm. We don't have uh, much time left but and we could talk to you for hours but I just want to mention that you are running the Ciro mm -hmm. project now right. which is another very bold move. I was talking to a group recently and, and talking about AIDS issues and I made some reference to the horror of criminalization of people with HIV and this woman stuck up her hand and she said well I'm a new chaplain at this organization and I want to know what you're talking about because I think people who are you know not disclosing their HIV status should be prosecuted and I thought you're a chaplain uh, so give well, us a few seconds about, on that. There's survey research about two-thirds of gay men think that it should be a criminal offense yes. not to disclose. That's yes. most people's initial reaction until they look into the issue and understand how uh, horrific it is as public health policy, how it is making the epidemic worse. Well, they can learn about you at SeanStrube.com. And there's, I have to say one thing. We've talked about all these serious things and political things we talked about. Yeah. There's a lot of fun in the book, too. Yes. The story uh, about Tennessee Williams. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, peeing off of Gore Vidal's balcony with him in, in Ravello <laughs> into the Sea of Salerno. There's a tease. Oh, There's, There's a tease. <laughs> Body Counts, a memoir of politics, sex, AIDS, and survival. Sean Strube. Uh, maybe we should do 20 minutes every week so yeah, we can get through me. the rest of the book. <laughs> we can do one chapter at a time. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you for thank coming. Thank you so much. Have thank you, fun, uh, and we'll see you soon. Okay, thanks. Okay. Hi, Sean. Bye.
All right, well, a lot of other news to get to, or we would have just spent the entire show talking to Sean, because there's a lot to talk about. But uh, the stunning news at the top of the news this week is... is the Ninth Circuit. Yeah. This is a, an appeals court. This is, Calif this is you know, the West Coast, and uh, known as a liberal circuit. And the case before them was an uh, appeal on w whether or not you could uh, preempt a gay juror just because he or she was gay or lesbian. And fascinatingly enough, in a pharmaceutical company versus pharmaceutical company Smith, case. Smith Klein Beecham. It's over a licensing agreement uh, for, with Abbott about HIV medication. And one of the companies had tried to exclude a juror from a, a jury because he was gay. This, they denied it, but it was clear. That this that's issue what has done. been around for a long time, yes. but it, now it's getting resolved. So, uh, uh, they, you know, so what they said is that sexual orientation needs to be subject to what's called heightened scrutiny, a heightened scrutiny uh, a level of judicial review, the second highest level below uh, strict scrutiny, which is extended to race. And so, when we're talking about scrutiny, what we mean is you look at a law and you that discriminates, and uh, subjecting it to higher scrutiny means it's a higher level of proof that the law is legitimate if it's discriminating against people. Because usually the, you know, the, the, the courts say the, the government probably had a good reason if they passed this law. But, but now you've got to say, well, wait a minute. Uh, you know. It's a higher level of suspicion. I yes. think that's what we should be calling it, not scrutiny, but suspicion. We'll coin a new word. So Judge Stephen Reinhardt there uh, cited the Windsor case the, that overturned There's Doma, the judge. Calling it unquestionably uh, higher than rational basis review. Um, and well, what's interesting about that is that the Supreme Court, in deciding the Windsor case, specifically did not label the level level of scrutiny it was giving to DOMA or suspicion. It just did an analysis of, uh, of, of the situation. And th this judge is reading that analysis and saying, I'm calling this heightened scrutiny. And I want to read a quote from this because it's rather moving from the judge. He said, striking a, a juror just because he or she is gay continues the deplorable tradition of treating gays and lesbians as undeserving of participation in uh, our nation's most cherished rites and rituals. They deprive individuals of the opportunity to participate in perfecting democracy and guarding our ideals of justice on account of a characteristic that has nothing to do with their fitness to serve. I but, mean, I read that. I mean, oh, I want to cry. You know, he they likes get us. It. He really yeah. likes us. Well, well, it's like the decision. Well, it's Max Reinhardt's grandson. Well, well it's <laughs> like the decision uh, I cited last week or the week before with a judge who said, you know, consent of the governed. And if and we yeah. have decided that if we're going to let the government run things, it has to be with treating everybody equally. And this, and you're not treating these people equally. So uh, wow. we like that. Now, it's not the first time that he heightened scrutiny, scrutiny has been applied to us, but I think it's kind of the biggest. And it has an immediate impact on the Nevada marriage case in the Ninth Circuit, also the Arizona and Oregon cases on marriage, and also the Arizona case on domestic partner benefits that uh, Governor Jan Brewer there rescinded our domestic partner benefits. So all that is going to be very, very helpful. It sets a new standard. Now, for instance, in the Tenth Circuit with Utah, there is no tradition of heightened scrutiny there. But there was no tradition, I think, of heightened scrutiny in uh, in the Windsor case, that, in the circuit that uh, that was decided in, and uh, that was one the of appeals, the appeals. In the appeals, there was a little bit of it. In yeah. the, the thing we went to, uh, yeah. there was a little bit of that, yes. Okay. All right. Well, there was a less clear uh, the, yes. precedent. Should we do uh, other marriage news? We could, yes, indeed. Uh, and maybe well, we wait should a minute. Go to... uh, as we have this, let's let's uh, let's do this one other case in Florida, which is kind of uh, interesting. In Cocoa, Florida, uh, high school student Robert Marucci. Yep. Uh, <laughs> He lives with his mother. She's poor. He wanted to get money for her. He did some porn. He's 18. He's of age. He's perfectly legal to do it. He's known as Noel on the Sean Cody uh, <laughs> website, if you're really interested. You Google that and you'll see him. So, no surprise, uh, somebody. <laughs> He's found a very talented him on there. performer. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you'll have to attest to that. Uh, and someone noticed this, informed the school, uh, the, and informed his, you know, 
know, word got out among his classmates, and some of his classmates were bullying him yes, about it. Severely. And he, yes, and going And after. he complains about this, and they decide to suspend him. For causing a disturbance. Yes. And then they say, because we have suspended you, you are not going to have enough days at school, and so you can't graduate. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a great little yes. catch 22. Are we going to show them the film? We are. We have a local news report on what happened on this. And so let's hit the Cocoa, Florida report. Well, the student had told us that he had been, he was kicked out of Cocoa High School for his role in an adult film. The district told me today that's wrong. The investigation is now over and Robert Marucci has been cleared. He's able to come back to school tomorrow morning, but there's still that lingering question. Why was he suspended in the first place? Robert Marucci is a senior at Cocoa High School. He's a good person. He's AB on a roll. He's in a leadership program. But it's what Melissa Lieb's son does outside of class that she says got him kicked out of school, posing for an adult website. And she flat out told me that my son was expelled, not just suspended, he was expelled due to his explicit adult lifestyle career. I did this to help my mother out, get us in a better economic uh, level. But today, Brevard County school leaders say that's incorrect. No child would ever be suspended for a job that they have outside of the school environment. But when we asked why he was suspended, they won't say, citing privacy laws. In this particular case, we had an investigation, which is now complete, and, um, and the student is welcome to come back and talk with Dr. Sullivan about his educational options. Administrators gave Marucci this referral slip, claiming he made threats, which may be why he was suspended. But when we checked with Coco police, who would have been notified, they call it a rumor. Meanwhile, the rumor mill has been on overdrive at Coco High. Some students have been protesting and campaigning to ensure their classmate can graduate in May. Wow. And those students, by the way, have gone on to Facebook, to social media. We have seen people on a support Robert Marucci website or Facebook page that has people talking from Maryland to New York to California on this story. But again, breaking at noon here, he is able to come back to school tomorrow morning. Oh, so we've got uh, uh, students standing up for gay porn stars. We've got students standing up for ca Catholic gay teachers. Uh, I think the, it's great. Uh, the next, I'm very pleased with this generation. Back to the 70s. Yeah. Congratulations and thank you. Well, let's move to Utah because there are some developments there. You may remember a judge legalized same-sex marriage. The governor tried to stop it. The the original judge turned him down. The Tenth Circuit judge turned him down, but the Supreme Court said yes, we'll stop it so, so while Utah, you appeal. So Utah wanted more time to uh, prepare a quote fulsome, detailed, and quality quality brief. Uh, fulsome, of course, means like uh, aesthetically, morally, or generally offensive. They don't know that, but. Oh, <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, anyway, they, they got more time. They gave him seven more days. We're kind of disappointed in this. Uh, oh, big deal. Uh, <laughs> well, oh, say that, to the, say that to the couples in Utah. Uh, uh, All right. Uh, we have nothing to fear. All right. And one of the reasons they wanted more time was because they did advertise advertise for a lawyer to <laughs> help them with now this they got appeal. somebody uh, relatively on the cheap. They were prepared to spend two million bucks. They're only going to pay him like about 300,000. Yes, Gene Shar, sure, something from D.C. So they're getting this. Who had to leave his big uh, law firm to do this. So and they bid him farewell without any great, uh, you know, we loved him uh, yeah. speech. So it's not going to be January 27th. It's going to be seven days later. But, uh, uh, and this new lawyer clerked for Scalia uh, and was an associate counsel to George H.W. Bush. Uh, so, yes, they get that. And there's still some question about whether Oklahoma's case will be folded into this right. now at the Tenth Circuit, especially since there is a little more time, but it still seems to me awfully fast for right. Oklahoma to get but in. The ACLU and a law firm there in Utah is suing the state for not recognizing same sex marriages already performed. Uh, the Attorney General's office uh, was uh, 
uh, n not making a, a determination about the validity of the marriages, but says that the amendment bars their recognition, and they're saying, hey, these people need their rights, and they need them now. They're legally married, and they should get full they're rights. They're getting them from the federal uh, government. But just to confuse matters further, the Utah Tax Commission says that these couples can file tax returns as yes. married. So, you know, Utah is a little confused at And the, the guy who went on a hunger strike to successfully stop these marriages from going forward is seriously considering a move to Russia, where they have more traditional values. Yeah, more on that later. And to get away from our Marxist government. Yeah. Uh, Delaware, by the way, and Massachusetts have joined the list of states where same-sex marriage is legal who have announced yes. that they will recognize the couples married in Utah. Um, and uh, and uh, polls and online comments in Utah show that opinions in the population in Utah generally are shifting very fast. And this, I think, is the phenomenon and why we've always wanted this to go forward. Because their God did not smite them. <laughs> no, because they saw these people exactly. and realized That's what I'm they, saying. Were, they the, were human beings and not, right. uh, you know, tailed monsters. There was monsters. such an outpouring in Utah and that huge demonstration that they had at the State House there exactly. last week. So they, oh, oh I get it. It's our family members and neighbors and friends. Well, you know, uh, uh, you know, Mormons, I mean, we're, I'm not fond of almost any religion, but they are generally accepting of other kinds of differences, like kids who are developmentally disabled are not treated very differently and, you know, are uh, welcomed within the community and all that kind well, of stuff. Well, tell so, it to the black people who couldn't be uh, <laughs> priests I, in the church till fairly well, recently. Had, but, but God but, had to give them a revelation in the late <laughs> 70s about that. Well, the Mormons certainly went through a lot of stigmatization Maybe of their own. God will give them a revelation about this. Yeah. You may also, yes, well, as someone uh, from California tweeted when uh, when the judge legalized same-sex marriage in the first place, since the Mormons had financed the whole Prop 8, uh, uh, you know, referendum and yes. the case against us, uh, karma's a bitch. Oh, language. <laughs> All right, other, other states uh, in Florida? Uh, they have, uh, they're filing, they're having a big same-sex marriage case there, but they're filing in, I'm interested in this, in state court in Miami, six couples, not in, this is NCL, yeah. NCLR in Equality Florida, not in federal court. Well, the, uh, that question has been asked, and the answer was you can make a federal claim in a state court. Okay. So maybe that's just you know, where they've decided the court of original jurisdiction is, and they're making a claim that the state law and constitutional amendment uh, All right. violate the federal constitution. Okay. Uh, in Indiana, here's mm. another fascinating development. Uh, well, it's interesting because we uh, we thought Indiana, forget it, we're losing big time there. This is well, well, going well, let's on for understand. a couple of years. I mean, it, it, while everybody else has moved on, uh, Indiana had not passed a constitutional amendment against same-sex marriage, and they finally got a, a majority in one of the houses of the legislature, So they're, uh, both houses, so they're ready to do it, and they passed it, and they have to pass it again. This is about passing it again, yeah. and all of, and it was supposed to just go through, as you say, and then the House Judiciary Committee looked like it was not going to pass it. Uh, what they held a hearing, everybody said, oh, "Okay, what can it's we going do? to the committee. It's going to pass." Blah blah blah. And then we get word later in the day, "Wait a minute, it hasn't passed yet. What's happening?" And the answer was that several Republicans on the committee ha were thinking, "Maybe I'll vote against this." But and so that so they moved it to the Elections Committee, and by the time you see this, they may have passed it out of the Elections Committee or not. Uh, but the thing is, if they've been peeling off Republicans, maybe they can stop it in the full... Uh, uh, there is a guy named Andrew Markle Alice. who is an openly gay Republican, it describes himself as a conservative, running for state representative in Indiana, and he is so angry about what the House Speaker has done in trying to manipulate the system now after saying, you know, we're, we're just going to go to judiciary, but now taking it away and putting it in this other committee, that he has quit the race for state rep, quit the Republican Party, and is speaking out and saying, you know, this is oh. outlandish. So Dirty tricks. things are really uh, up in arms in Indiana. In Ohio, the state government doesn't have a heart there. They're even appealing the ruling that lets you have a death certificate for your dead oh, spouse. Oh, you have to. You have to. It's You You can't give them an inch. They'll take a mile once you... The gays. Yes. yes once true. you establish the principle that we have any rights, uh, they can't stop us. So... 
Mike DeWine, who is a very conservative former member of Congress who is now the Attorney General of Ohio, promised he was going to appeal that uh, decision, and he has now. I don't think he's going to get anywhere with interesting, it. Interesting statistic out of Iowa, and maybe this is true across the country, they found, they've had same-sex marriage for several years there under a court order. They found that same-sex marriages increased significantly in Dubuque County after federal rights were granted in June. Absolutely. There are a lot of people who, uh, who have waiting. said for years, uh, I'm not getting married because it's useless, because I have no federal rights. Well, it's and not that useless. Have, well, that was how it was seen, okay. that it was not worth it. In uh, Houston, uh, Mayor Anise Parker, out lesbian, now in her third and we final term. We have a picture term. of her there. Uh, there they are. That's when, Anise on the right there. Uh, and that's Kathy Hubbard, her partner of 23 years on the left. They got married on their 23rd anniversary in, of course, Palm Springs, California, because they uh, wouldn't be able to be married in Texas legally, but they are legally married, and but she's, Texas And she's co-chair of Mayors for the Freedom to Marry, and uh, our mayor in New York is married to a, 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 an out lesbian, too. <laughs> sort <laughs> of. It's true. Former out lesbian. Well, she was, she was out. She was. Yes. Uh, Seattle, uh, more uh, doings at Eastside Catholic School, the independent music coach we told you about. Uh, who is, announced she was going to marry her uh, partner and was uh, afraid she, her contract would not be renewed as an independent contractor. Well, the school has now said, has given her a new contract, uh, even though she is marrying her partner, I guess on the grounds that she is not a school employee full-time, right. but is an independent contractor. I think they're splitting hairs these days. In and. Uh, I don't know what their standards are anymore. In Paxton, Illinois, uh, a bed and breakfast called Timber Creek bars civil union ceremonies and is waiting a ruling in a 2011 case from the Illinois Human Rights Commission about this. Uh, they want to be ex an exemption because they're religious, they, because it's run by religious people. But those are the kinds of exemptions that we're against. I will try to do this briefly. I have now talked ad nauseum about the Rose Parade and the oh. marriage float from the uh, AIDS Healthcare Foundation. I charged uh, television coverage was uh, Jacques. dismissive and perfunctory. Uh, the folks, particularly the gay folks at HGTV, said, "Wait a minute, we're very we're a gay network practically, and we certainly gave full coverage." So I made them send me the. Uh, clip and I will say they did give full coverage. I still think it was a little brief, but uh, it's no, but it it's was never full enough for coverage. you people. Never. <laughs> uh, but but RFD TV, which is a sort of country station, reran the parade and uh, completely omitted the uh, flow. So HGTV is way ahead of them. Okay. Uh, and I hear the uh, Hallmark Channel did a good job with it too. So you got more marriage stuff? I don't think so. Okay. Oh, uh, unless we go to the Oregon uh, Bureau of Labor. Uh, yes. Which decided that the store Sweet Cakes by Melissa in Gresham, Oregon, discriminated against a lesbian couple by refusing to make their wedding cake because, you know, it's against their religion. And I'm sure they don't make cakes for divorced people or any people who have committed adultery in their lives or anything like that. Now, this guy has to settle this case or he's got to go to court over it. Uh, but a local newspaper had. Guy, a isn't it Melissa? It's uh, Melissa and her yeah, husband, yeah. I think. But they've, it's been a man in the, most of the uh, oh, stories. Okay. Anyway, you're right about Melissa. Anyway, a local newspaper, you know, to, to figure out whether this guy was you know, on the up and up in terms of his religious principles, placed orders for cakes celebrating a divorce, the pagan solstice, celebrating the cloning of stem cells, and uh, celebrating a baby a born out of wedlock. <laughs> I thought you were going to say an abortion case. No, no, no. Well, that's, <laughs> that might have caught his attention. All of these orders were filled, despite what Jesus says about these things. So uh, I, I, what's going I think he just hates gay people. That's what I Could think. Could that be true? Yeah. Uh, well, what they have done is move the business into their home. Uh, I don't know if that will protect them any better, but uh, that's their their latest move. To anyway, try to get away from uh, oh, we've got. Did we mention that Virginia is going to have the hearing on their same-sex marriage case on January 30th? Uh, we'll get to that when they get to it. All right. 
Uh, eh, President Obama has nominated an out uh, African American lesbian, uh, Stacy Michelle Yandel, to the district court for the Southern District of Illinois, nominated by Dick Durbin, the senator. Okay. Uh, she would be the second out lesbian African American on a federal court in following Deborah Batts. In Seattle, a man, 32, Mitchell Taylor, was charged with threatening out gay mayor Ed Murray and a socialist city council member posting 20 threats on Murray's Facebook page. Uh, uh, his defense lawyer says he has Asperger's syndrome and was off his meds. <laughs> it's a common explanation these days. Oh, and by the way, I mentioned uh, last week a, a play I, I said a, a, a called, a, um, I forget the title of the play, uh, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, which is coming here, and I said it's about an autistic boy, and someone reminded me, we, 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 we don't talk like that, we say a boy with autism. Even so, the New York Times has changed its usage, yes, I noted. So if they can do it, we can do it here at Gay USA. A federal court of appeals says Massachusetts uh, it upheld the lower court decision. Massachusetts must pay for uh, gender reassignment surgery for an inmate, uh, describing it as medically necessary. This has caused some uproar in Massachusetts. State paying for uh, surgery for a transsexual inmate. But uh, the courts are, I think, uh, seeing this clearly and making those decisions. And staying in Massachusetts and Boston, the St. Pat's parade there excludes gays, and it also excludes veterans for peace. And uh, it's, the parade is run by the Allied War uh, Veterans mm -hmm. Council. So mm -hmm. they're tr with the new mayor there, even though the last mayor was pro-gay, they are trying to apply again and make it one big parade for everybody. Up there, they have like two parades. Uh, yes, that would be fine here, too. But they don't allow it here. No, um, but we may do some we'll organizing see. We'll on that. We'll see. In Virginia, uh, uh, another transgender inmate, Ophelia uh, Delonta, uh, is going to be paroled uh, after serving 34 years of a 73-year sentence for robbery. Mm. Uh, she is suing for surgery. She's made several attempts at self-castration, and the Virginia prison system has evidently decided, let's get rid of her rather than deal with any of this. Uh, in Pennsylvania, the voter ID law there, it's a voter suppression law, was struck down, and this is to the great relief uh, for transgender voters yes. uh, who were one of the ten plaintiffs in the case. And... Uh, uh, because, you know, they have trouble matching up their appearance with their name and the this and the gender and all this kind of stuff. Absolutely. Yes. And, you know, they'll do anything to stop you from voting. And Republicans in, And will, in mostly. another sad case that has gotten quite a bit of notice now on the uh, Internet, there's a, a sports uh, column online oh, called yeah. Grantland, uh, or site, named, I assume, after Grantland Rice, the uh, famous sports writer. From and, the 20s and yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, this uh, young writer for this website, uh, Caleb Hannon, uh, got intrigued by the story of this great new putter. And, you know, we're golfers, so yeah. we pay attention to this, too. And so he thought, you know, wow, this is a great story. And he heard a that there was A new scientifically this, aerodynamically yes, designed putter. And this woman who was a scientist had, uh, had designed this. So he called her up and he wanted to interview her and talk to her about this. And she said to him, I will talk to you if you agree that you're writing just about the science and not about me, the scientist. Yes, the name is S.A. Vanderbilt. Uh, well, that was the name she purported to be, S.A. and Vanderbilt doctor. And as he looked into this, he found all sorts of problems with her story. He found that she had changed her name, that she didn't have the academic credentials she claimed, and that she was transsexual. And he, in violation of uh, his agreement to write only about the science and not the scientist, started telling her that he was going to reveal all of this. And she ended up uh, committing suicide Horrible. Uh, before this was published. And then he went ahead and published it. And then the uh, website said how proud they were of this great story. That's and outrageous. then the editor of the website, a couple of weeks later, after people started objecting, said, oh, maybe we were wrong. Maybe we shouldn't have published it. Uh, there were a lot of problems with this story. But they never got to the real problem, which was that he had violated his journalistic 
right. uh, uh, promise. It, uh, they sort of said, well, yes, I guess it was a little too icky to write about uh, a transgender person without talking to anyone who was transgender before. Right. I mean, I, look, we do talk about a lot of people on this show who would rather us not talk about them being gay who are public figures. Uh, we're especially likely to do it if the person is working against gay rights. <laughs> uh, but. I, I, I'm not going to make that distinction, but go ahead. No, I, and we don't. I mean, but we, we say try to write we, honestly. We, people we, 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 yes, who are but, public figures. But if you make an agreement and yes. the person had a special reason for having yes. this agreement, yes. it is an outrage what this guy did. Completely. Okay. On a couple of nicer notes, uh, a, a military story. Commander Rich Jarrett has just taken over as the commander of the Littoral, L I T T O R A L combat ship USS Freedom. He appears to be the first out gay married commander of a U.S. warship and uh, the report we got was that he gave this tremendous moving speech to the crew and family members when the change of command ceremony took place had everybody in tears spoke so movingly of his husband and this was evidently quite a big deal. Right. So and congratulations, will, Commander Jarrett. And we will be uh, we will be folding the show next week because <laughs> we have won. No, here's the news that shows we've won: Starkville, Mississippi. <laughs> Go ahead. Hell has frozen over. The Starkville, Mississippi Council, I retract everything nasty I've ever said about Mississippi. Everything has passed a resolution supporting equality. Every person has inherent worth, no matter their race, creed, color, sexual orientation, or gender identity, discrimination is, quote, anathema to the public policy of the city, unquote. Starkville, Mississippi. Starkville, Mississippi, population 24,000. They haven't gotten the memo in the Methodist Church. Uh, they are putting another pastor on trial for, for performing a same-sex wedding. It's Reverend Thomas Ogletree. He goes on trial March 10th. He's a retired elder in the New York District, former dean of Yale Divinity School. The church is also trying Reverend Stephen Heiss of Upper New York for performing uh, the wedding of his lesbian daughter in 2002. They take a little time with these things. Yes, but they're trying to be consistent. And Reverend Sarah Thompson Got to admire Tweed, that. Uh, and they're also <laughs> going after Reverend Thompson uh, Sarah Thompson Tweedy of the New York uh, Annual Conference for being a self-avowed practicing oh, I lesbian. That. Yeah, I love self-avowed. Avowed. Avowed. Uh, uh, in the old days in the New York Times, we used to be listed as avow an avowed homosexual. We took <laughs> vows somewhere. <laughs> avowed. Like, who would want to admit that? All right. All right. On to Russia and other international news. Well, if you saw Vladimir Putin getting interviewed this week, it was all about gay stuff. It all was. The, they had this reporters from China and Britain and all these places and asking George him. George Stephanopoulos. Yes. And uh, he, uh, you know, among the other things, he said, uh, he said, we don't have a ban on non-traditional forms of sexual interaction between people. We have a ban against promoting homosexuals and pedophilia to minors. Let's put those two things together. Uh, they're totally different things, meaning not pedophilia and homosexuality, but propaganda and to children and being gay. Uh, we're not banning uh, anything. We're not grabbing anyone off the street. He asserted uh, the U.S. And then he tried to assert that the U.S. has criminal penalties and we don't for homosexuality. But those are things that are on the books that can't be enforced because of uh, the striking down of the sodomy laws by the Supreme Court in 2003, yes. which George Stephanopoulos tried to say over, over him while he was talking. Well, what Putin ended up saying was uh, gay people are welcome at Sochi, but leave the children in peace. Please. <laughs> Yeah, right. Um, uh, and then he posed. Uh, he posed for a picture with some <laughs> Olympic, Russian Olympic volunteers, all in rainbow uniforms. What the hell is that about? <laughs> uh, uh, he was asked about that, actually, and he said, I didn't design the uniforms. Yeah. He won't <laughs> say whether he believes people are born gay or not, uh, but the new law on sexual orientation... Uh, uh, suggests that the new law suggests that sexual orientation can be influenced by propaganda. The whole idea of keeping it away from kids, any mention of homosexuality is you can change them. 
It, it's ridiculous. It's nonsensical. It's defamatory. It's disgusting. And really, what he's not dealing with is all the violence uh, that is being perpetrated against gay people uh, who've been given permission by this law. But uh, more on that in a second. I, I want to mention a couple of uh, demonstrations that Queer Nation did last week. First, one, we went to uh, uh, see Brian Boitano, who it turns out was appearing uh, in a little public appearance at the Rubin Museum in, in Chelsea. Introduced as a great human rights activist, and I believe somebody shouted, based on what? <laughs> And what the hell did Brian Boitano ever do for human rights? Our pal We're waiting to hear. Well, that's what our pal Duncan got up and yelled this at the uh, introducer, who he said was being just ridiculously lugubrious. And Boitano just sat there silently with nothing to say. And when they say something about wrong about me in an introduction, I interrupt them. <laughs> well, Duncan like, my name is not... Hume, Dun it's hum. Duncan and Jamie <laughs> got dragged out. And then we, uh, a couple days later, we went to the Today Show because we wanted to remind NBC that they're covering this and they ought to be talking about this stuff. There we are. There there's we Duncan are. right there in the middle. Yeah, there's Ken on the end and you between them. Oh, and I'm a little am, further I'm down I'm the film. line. Yep. So we just chose a moment when they were live from the plaza. They cut away. Well, of course they cut away. I didn't expect anything different. But what we did was remind NBC in person that we are watching. We can get them anytime. We can't and get them at Sochi. <laughs> well, I'm not sure anybody's going to be gotten at Sochi because, uh, you know, now we have warships in the harbor and uh, terrorist uh, threats. Johnny Weir's not afraid. I would, I could never boycott the Olympics, whether they be in Pyongyang, in Uganda, in Iran, or Mars, he said. His parents are worried about him, but he reassured them by saying, Elton John has gotten in and out safely. Elton John. He didn't who, go to Sochi. Who, who, uh, who uh, 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 Putin said he'd be happy to meet with. Exactly. Uh, and he, uh, Johnny says he worries about Russian LGBT people, and he wants to be there for them. I'm just going there to be me, to be gay, to be proud, to be a strong light for the Russian LGBT community, uh. and my lifetime of sacrifices won't be ruined <laughs> by politics at Sochi. It's all this, you know. Me, 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 me. And I, you know, all these athletes, I sacrifice so much. Uh, what, do you think you have some right to uh, right. to this uh, event? No, you don't. None of us have any rights to any of this. Right. And uh, and get over yourselves. So, right. so the torch is still running around Russia, uh, yes. making its way to Sochi. And uh, they're doing one of their, their normal things. And a protester, a lone guy, comes out of the crowd and just stands there with his little rainbow flag. Let's go to picture two. Yep. Flip them. yep. Boom. They grab them. Uh, they grab the uh, security officers in the cow costumes, which is what it looks like to me. Some Does it look like a cow costume Some of them to have Coca-Cola oh, logos this, on there. This is a Sochi security guy. That is an, an IOC uniform. Uh, with the guy who's grabbing the protester. Uh, the IOC has uh, dirty hands on all this, and they are badly involved in this kind well, of Well, don't worry. The, the Dutch brass band that performs at speed skating is, is considering playing YMCA. <laughs> I don't know if that's enough to uh, bring gayness into well, this. Well, it turns out they did it in 2002, before. They're reviving it. <laughs> <laughs> Not if the IOC has anything to do with it. Well, no one's going to Sochi anyway. A third of the tickets are unsold. They haven't finished building the hotels yet. It is a mess But, but over Britain there. is sending the, uh, the, the government minister who was responsible for the same-sex marriage law. Uh, the a member of the IOC, a 75-year-old Italian, says it's absurd for the U.S. to send four lesbians as part of its delegation. Brian Boitano is offended by that remark. Yeah. <laughs> by the way, I wish that the, they had asked the, uh, Putin about the bill on banning uh, same-sex parents, uh, because now they're considering uh, denying custody to any parent who leaves a straight relationship for a gay one. Yes. And the sponsor of the bill asks yes. the more pro-gay West to be tolerant of them. Well, the CEO of the USOC, Scott Blackman, says he encourages U.S. athletes to speak out before the games, but once they get to Sochi, the focus should be on sport. And IKEA has responded to complaints about them dropping a lesbian couple from their custom, customer magazine in the Russian version by saying that the Russian law prevents them from doing so. Now, 
wait a minute, you know. Uh, That's what they said in the first no, place. No, 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 no. But, I mean, the, but to make a flat statement like that. So they put up a vision statement online pledging fair treatment for all employees, including on the basis of oh, sexual please. orientation, including in Russia. But, I mean, they can't make that flat statement that it violates the law. You've got to test the that law. That was their original excuse for taking the couple out of the magazine. All right. Uh, yes, you do have to challenge the law. So CNN had a very good summary of all the instances of violence uh, perpetrated against gay people in Russia. And if you go on the CNN.com website and look for reports by Phil Black, you can find Russian vigilantes targeting gay men. We told you last week that the head of that, the, the chief brutalizer, Maxim Martsinkovich, something like that, had, uh, who's running Occupy Pedophilia, is what they call it, had fled to Cuba. He has now been arrested yes. by Interpol in Cuba. Uh, this is uh, one of the best pieces of news I've heard on all this. We've only got three minutes here, so we're going to have to flip through these okay. uh, headlines Queer, quickly. Queer Nation Town Hall meeting next Tuesday, the 28th at 7 p.m. to make more plans for demonstrations against the Olympics and on Nigeria. Which has intensified uh, the uh, the prosecutions under the anti-gay law. They have spread to the south as well as the, the which is more liberal uh, from the north. It's all which is more Christian. Uh, those arrested have been forced to give other names. Uh, gay people are trying to get the hell out of the country if they can if they're identified as gay. Uh, it's terrible. They're rounding them up and they're going to prosecute them. And and in Muslim areas they could be stoned to death. Uh, good uh, semi good news from Uganda. We were were afraid that the president there was on the verge of signing the law that the parliament passed, but he used the excuse of no quorum in parliament to say, I'm not going to sign it. I'll work on a compromise bill. And also that he thinks we're sick. We shouldn't yeah. be killed or yeah. imprisoned yeah. or jailed what for life. No, well, what do you prison. do with abnormal people? Jailed for life. In, in the United Kingdom, a, a right-wing member of the UKIP party, the right-wing party there, uh, blamed uh, the uh, storms and floods in Britain on uh, 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 gay marriage. Uh, he left the conservative party o over this. Yeah, and he's finally been ex uh, expelled or suspended from the party. A Kenyan author uh, of One Day I Will Write About this place has published uh, another unknown chapter coming out as gay and in Budapest Hungary a court says the cops were wrong to ban a pride parade and we did get a gay panel of all this over in Davos that big conference but it was paid for by Paul Singer a vulture capitalist who has a gay son and I'm very concerned about any of our groups taking money from him uh, all right, AIDS news. The uh, World Bank and UN AIDS will work together on ending uh, extreme poverty and AIDS. We have a new health commissioner of New York, Dr. Mary Bassett, who has a lot of good experience in this area. We'll and see what she does. At the SAG After Awards, Matthew McConaughey and Jared Leto won for Dallas Buyers Club again, yeah. but this time they made a point of talking about AIDS because they got a lot of heat for not doing it at the Golden Globes. Uh, and The Bachelor and Sherry Shepard were in trouble for saying nasty things about gay people. They've both uh, sort of apologized, kind of, maybe. Uh, and we saw the new show Looking on uh, HBO. With Jonathan Groff. Uh, very thin, even uh, though I yeah. like the director. He's the guy who did Weekend, which was a very good movie. Uh, the characters so far are not engaging, but we'll keep watching. We'll give it a chance. We'll keep chance. watching. And we love the Carol King musical, Beautiful. We did, yeah. And uh, Machinal, uh, the the new the, the revival of a 1920s play, less so. And if you get a chance to see "I Am the Wind," it will not blow you away. <laughs> I had to get that in there. See you next week. Bye bye.